Hi everyone, my name is Cheryl Cohen. I am with Arthritis Consumer Experts and we're hosting our eighth annual hashtag See Arthritis event at the annual scientific meeting of the Canadian Arthritis, uh, Canadian Rheumatology Association and Arthritis uh, Health Professionals Association meetings. They conduct a joint meeting. These are the very people that care for us in our day-to-day -day lives with arthritis. And I'm so excited to introduce you to Emily McGuire, who's an undergraduate student in psychology at University of British Columbia, and uh, did this work on help-seeking behaviors and treatment preferences for sleep problems among persons with inflammatory arthritis with Arthritis Research Canada. So we're super happy to have you here, Emily. And uh, we're gonna put you in the hot seat and ask you really all about your paper. As you know, from doing this work, sleep disturbance in people with inflammatory arthritis is a big deal. It's a pain in our backside, frankly. And uh, we're really eager to hear what you've learned uh, by doing work with us as people living with rheumatic disease. So over to you, tell us about your study. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So I also wanted to mention that um, my study was supervised by Deborah DaCosta. And right. so we did a study on sleep and how people manage their insomnia and what they need. Um, and so this was for people among um, who have arthritis. And so we found that, um, and so we know that there's a need for this because 90% of people who have arthritis reported um, needing want, need, wanting help with insomnia. Um, and so we found that around 40% of our participants said that they felt a need to talk about insomnia, but decided not to. And some of the most common reasons for that was that they thought the insomnia would just go away by itself um, or that it was just a natural response to a stressful life situation. So they made an assumption that kind of nothing could be done about it. And it was something that just was going to come along and be with them for the rest of their lives. Yeah, exactly. And so yeah. the goal of the study was to be able to adapt a cognitive behavioral therapy program for people to manage insomnia. And so cognitive behavioral therapy is um, a type of treatment that helps people reconstruct their thoughts to be more helpful for sleep. Um, and so that's, that program is really going to help people overcome these barriers, like thinking that they're always going to have insomnia and there's nothing that can be done. So in other words, you're going to work to develop a program that changes the way people think about their, their insomnia. So breaking down those assumptions that you spoke of a, a minute ago, which is really super cool. I guess uh, I've always heard that um, be termed as sort of reframing. So you're going to reframe the way someone thinks about um, their insomnia. Can you tell me uh, and our audience, Emily, what's the difference between sleep disturbances and insomnia? I mean, is insomnia a type of sleep disturbance? You're not really even asleep when you're an insomniac. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess what characterizes insomnia is having a lot of sleep disturbances. So some people can experience symptoms of insomnia and sleep disturbance without meeting the criteria for insomnia. And so okay. if your sleep disturbances just get really bad, I guess that would be insomnia. Okay. Now, what were some of the things that people talked to you about? I mean, what are some of the questions that you asked people? What did they tell you what was keeping them up at night? Did they, like, did they yeah. didn't have any kind of that qualitative or quantitative data to share with us? So, so a lot of people said that pain was definitely a barrier. And although we haven't really assessed this yet, I'm assuming that people will be saying that anxiety is something that really um, stops them from sleeping. Um, and so the, the point of the cognitive behavioral therapy program will also reduce anxiety by reframing the thoughts because the more anxious you are about not being able to fall asleep, the worse it is for you to be able to fall asleep. Right. It's the, the more you worry about it, the less you will sleep. Yeah. Um, what about anxiety over other things? Like not about sleeping, but anxiety they carry over from, from their day. Yeah, I would assume that also um, makes sleep worse because I know that people who have insomnia, the insomnia tends to get worse when they experience more stress in their life. Okay, interesting. Now, um, I have to ask this question. I don't know if it's part of your study, so you can, uh, you can just tell me that if that's the case. But we know that these things oops, can be really problematic for sleep. So did you ask or dig around uh, in your questioning of, of the people that you worked with in this study about their use of digital devices at night? 
Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, we actually haven't analyzed that data yet, but we do have a question about um, digital use because I know that the light makes it worse for people to fall asleep. And also um, it's sometimes maybe being on your phone is relaxing for some, but for others, it might be more stressful. Um, and so it is recommended that you stop being on all electronics one hour before you go to bed. One hour. Okay, well, that's a good piece of takeaway advice uh, right right now. So you heard her, you heard her, folks. Don't look at your devices an hour before bedtime. Um, you know, I, I'm. Uh, I think if you want to guarantee insomnia, just look at Twitter, and then you'll you'll not. It's so depressing to go to Twitter sometimes. Uh, that's how I get all anxious as I look at my Twitter feed. Um, anything else you'd like to share with us about this work and, and sort of the, the, the program itself, what you hope to develop? Yeah, so um, there definitely is a need for the program. We actually asked participants um, what treatment preference they would like. So they said 90% of participants said that they would be willing to try this cognitive behavioral therapy program online, which was very promising. Um, and this was actually preferable over doing it in person um, and the, doing the same program in person, I mean, and both of which were preferable over taking medication to help manage sleep. Wow, that's incredible. 95%. So you've got big demand there. Uh, yeah, around for, 90. For this type of program, a built-in a built-in user audience. Um, <laughs> lots of people probably willing to test a program like that too. Um, mm -hmm. So will you be recontacting the people that came through your study so that they can continue on? Yes, we're going to be contacting. Um, well, I guess we don't really have the email address of the exact people who took it, but we're going to be sending it through the same like patient organizations and posting on the same social media to then pilot test the study. Okay, perfect. So I think we helped send out a few of those e-blasts ourselves. Um, <laughs> so we're eager to do that. Hopefully some of our members participated and would be willing to, to join in again uh, for this next uh, phase of the, of the work. Well, Emily, thank you so much for coming in and sharing uh, with us this work. It's super exciting. Uh, it's super great to have young people uh, coming, being lured into the rheumatology field. So we're very happy uh, about that. And we look forward to chatting with you again about uh, the events of this project. Thank you so much. I look forward to chatting with you again too. Excellent. Bye everyone. Thanks for tuning in. If you want to give us your thoughts about uh, sleep disturbances you may be experiencing, you can always share that with us at feedback at arthritis, uh, jointhealth.org. So feedback at jointhealth.org. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Emily. Thank you.